Lake Keystone up by Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, meeting uh, Mr. Brent Gordon. He's the Northeast Regional Director of Fisheries for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife. Uh, talking about food safety, uh, how big an impact, what kind of numbers of fishermen do we have here in Oklahoma? Uh, you know, the Department of Wildlife is strictly funded by our license sales of both our hunter and fishermen. Uh, we have about 800,000 uh, anglers here in the state. Uh, th that's pretty level. Uh, yeah, over the years, that stayed pretty level. It hasn't gone up or gone down either way. Uh, but that's including our part-time fishermen or three-day fishermen and our annual licenses, and also it, it's including our lifetime and our senior citizen license. So they're one of our bigger stakeholders, that's for sure. Well, with 800,000 uh, licensed fishermen and then uh, some exempt fishermen, we probably got up close to uh, a million people fishing. Looks like uh, there's a big opportunity for this fragile type of food product. Uh, once we at the, remove it from the point of harvest until we get it to the table for some problems to occur. There is a lot. and. Uh, as in food safety, the whole HACCP thing uh, applies to fishing also and, and getting your, uh, your catch to the table and handling it correctly and, and making sure that uh, you don't have any pathogens that, that go through it. Well, handling this fish, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, however, in this segment, what kind of impact does water quality have on the type of product that we, we have? Water quality is a, a big issue and also in how we manage these fish. We're, we're taking a lot more uh, concerns and looks at, at uh, what's in that water, uh, what's in the soil and things like that, such as mercury. Mercury is one thing that we uh, test our fish for uh, regularly with DQ, sending in liver samples and meat samples and making sure that we're below that mercury level. So, so water quality is a big issue with us. Uh, uh, usually fish are a very good indicator of what's going on with that water quality, so we monitor it pretty heavy. Well, as a average fisherman, if I were to show up here and there were some water quality issues such as mercury or some kind of contaminant, how would I know or how would you alert me to this? Uh, you know, when we do our testing, uh, DQ uh, put out alert on a couple of their lakes this year. Uh, most of them are in the southeast. We do have one here in the northeast, uh, Hayburn which has pretty high mercury levels, but uh, we get those out to the news uh, paper. We have a, a group of, uh, in the Department of Division of Information Education, and they make sure all that stuff gets out to the, the proper uh, media. I know that uh, as a fisherman, uh, the department sets limits on number of fish you can catch, size of fish you can catch. What's the purpose of that? And tell us a little bit more about how you manage the fish for the public in Oklahoma. Over the years, we've got a, a lot better about uh, targeting fish and in our sampling procedures. This electrofishing boat, uh, we use that to go out and look at our largemouth bass populations. Uh, we also look at our blue cat and channel cat populations with, with this. But uh, we go out every spring and fall and look at these populations and, and we do it randomly. So statistically, we kind of know what's going on with that population. And that's set, uh, our limits are set from what we find out here in our sampling uh, procedures on, on what we think that population can withhold. It also depends a lot on what our uh, stakeholders or anglers uh, want out of a, a certain population. If they want a trophy striped bass population, you know, that we try to manage it that way. Uh, but, you know, we have to keep everybody in mind there. We don't want to stop that uh, kid that catches his first fish from keeping it, taking it home and eating it pairing it because uh, that, that's really a big deal. With all this being said about food safety and management of uh, fish, uh, can we get you to take us out and show us some of this habitat and shock up a few of these Sure, fish? absolutely. It's kind of a fun part of our job. So all right. That. Let's go see some fish. <laughs>
if I was an angler and I'm fishing in, in waters that the water quality is good, what signs do I see in a fish to make me know that he's healthy? You know, the first thing you kind of start looking at on fish is, is the tail areas for parasite. Parasites are out in there in the water constantly. It's just like a lot of your other disease with cattle and things. Those, those diseases and even the cold virus, it's out there all the time. It's when you get weak and, and stressed and run down that they kind of take over. So it starts showing up in, in areas like the, the fins and, and you'll look for parasites on there, that, that's a good place to look. A healthy fish will, is able to ward those off and, and take care of those. Also, uh, you start looking at the gill color, see how red that is, uh, that's another area. Uh, the slime on a fish is very important. That slime on that fish kind of serves like our skin does in, in keeping diseases off that fish. So any way that you can put less stress on that fish so it doesn't have to produce so much slime to to ward off the parasites and et cetera is always good. A little salt in the water uh, kind of helps that slime coat a little, uh, reduces the stress on the fish, keeping it well aerated, that water, uh, when you're holding that fish. Uh, another thing that helps uh, a lot is keeping that water temperature cool. If that, in the summertime, that's a little hard to do, but you can trade out your water, you can take ice with you, uh, et cetera and keeping it aerated, that really helps reduce the stress on the fish. And if that fish doesn't have a whole lot of stress, uh, then that fish is going to remain healthy. Uh, you can see this fish right here. Uh, it, its stomach area down through here is not gant. This fish is feeding well. Uh, our weights on, on our fish here in Keystone are always pretty good. It's a pretty fertile system. So, so those are kind of some of the things you look for. Uh, I believe we have a crappie in here also. There he is. Let's see if I can catch him. And That's a nice size crappie too. It's a nice too, crappie. It? Trying to hang on to him. But once again, you know, you can see the fish has got a little, a uh, few little parasites on the end of it, which is, is natural out here. But when you start seeing that complete tail and all these fins completely ate up with those parasites, et cetera. That's when you get worried, but this fish is in good shape. You, you can see it's, it's a stomach, it's, it's a thick fish. Uh, the gills are good on it. Look how red those are. Uh, there's a lot of slime on this fish. Uh, so this fish would be a good fish to eat? This would be a great fish to eat. All right. This is a, a non-game fish that we have here state. It's a smallmouth buffalo. Uh, you can see it's in good shape. But you really don't think about these fish right here having a lot of uh, problems. They're more on the bottom of the food chain, uh, eating uh, scavenger type fish. Uh, but you can see it's in good shape too. Uh, we have a flathead, which is one of our top predators here in the state. Probably our, is the top predator fish this is similar to the musky and things up north, uh, the flathead. It strictly eats live fish. This is the sort of fish that you really start testing for as far as diseases and what's going on with the water quality because it, it's a top predator and, and hangs on to it. So this is one that we'd probably take and, and look at, take a liver sample and, and test for mercury and et cetera. So the, the bioaccumulation occurs mostly in these predator fish yeah. that feed on smaller fish. Yeah, they're, they're kind of the top of the food chain. Okay. Well, we had a successful fish shocking survey. Mr. Gordon showed us some the nice game fish here in Oklahoma and described the physical qualities of a healthy fish, talked about water quality. These will have to be returned back. This is not a legal means of taking these fish, but we're going to Thank Mr. Gordon and go see if we can catch a few of these of our, on our own. Okay. You know, it's kind of late in the day and the fishing's a little slow. We've uh, caught two or three little fish out here, but they're not biting all that well. 
My favorite's a curly tail black worm. However, uh, every good fisherman always keeps uh, their secret weapon. I call it calling on Pete. Big fish tremble when they hear me call Pete the backup. Yeah, there he is. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. I told you, Pete never lets me down. Now that we've got some fish on the stringer and we're through, we're ready to go back to our final destination to clean these fish. The single most important thing that we can do to preserve the quality of this meat for good fillets to eat is to get them iced down. These fish have naturally expired outside the water and if they sit around and stay warm, lactic acid builds up, we have a condition much like dark cutters in the beef cattle industry. But if we'll put these fish on ice just as soon as we can, get them cooled down, it'll preserve the texture and uh, the freshness of this fish. We know from the commercial fishing industry that for every hour a dead fish sets outside and not iced down, it decreases shelf life by one day. We had a fairly productive day fishing today. I mentioned earlier I liked a little breeze to put a ripple on the water when I fish, but we got that and then more today. The big fish you saw us catch at the end, we went ahead and threw him back, but we did catch several of these smaller fish so we can demonstrate how to fillet fish. There are several different ways, probably as many ways to clean a fish as there are fish to catch. And uh, you may have a way or technique that works well for you that we're not gonna demonstrate today. I'm sure there's some old timers that have probably been catching fish longer than I've been alive that have methods that may be different from this. And if that works for you, that's great. Now that we've got the fish here, we've got them iced down, Let's talk about our fish cleaning station. A fish cleaning station has four components. A cutting surface, a knife, a receptacle for waste, and some type of receptacle to put the clean fillets in. This uh, area here is, is a very simple piece of equipment, yet it's, it's quite functional. I looked on the internet yesterday and fish cleaning stations for your backyard can run up to five to six hundred dollars they won't do any better job than this. The first component to our cleaning station is a cutting surface. A lot of professional guides and fishermen like to use plywood, a thin plywood board, as a cutting surface. Um, they claim that it allows the fish not to slip around as much, it's easier to clean fish on them, and it's pretty easy to replace if it becomes broken or torn up. Even a surface like this, it's made out of concrete, it's fairly easy to use or it's top of a concrete picnic table. However, the same problem arises with concrete as it does plywood. It is not, it is a porous structure and it's got little cracks, little knife cuts, little crevices and holes where bacteria and dirt and that sort of thing can reside. So it's impossible to completely disinfect those two surfaces like plywood or this concrete without painting it with a, a sealer and then we don't want that to get onto our meat. The only two FDA approved cutting surfaces for cleaning fish is a high density polyethylene plastic like this. This is very common in the, in the meat processing industry. It's easy to clean. It's, uh, you can completely sanitize this and, and clean it up and it works real well. Also, it, uh, it's, it's more forgiving on your knives than a surface like concrete. One other surface is a Pyrex or hard glass. This works well as a cutting surface and it is also FDA approved. Uh, it can be completely sanitized and cleaned uh, properly. I like to keep uh, some kind of small bowl with a little bit of soap in it. And before I start, I like to clean everything up. We've washed the cleaning surface, we've washed the instruments, the knives, that sort of thing before we started and rinsed them with water. 
probably if we've been handling these fish for a while, it's a good idea if we wash our hands also. When we talk about the fish, uh, we had a nice productive day and we have some left here. So if we were to take a fish out of the ice chest, what does a healthy fish look like? The eyes should be clear. If they're hazy and gray, it means that the fish dried out. The eyes should be nice and clear, slick, shiny surface. It also should be very turgid, which means it looks like it's inflated and still has pressure. If it's flat or collapsed, it means the fish is probably dehydrated. The other thing we like to look for is gill color. Even though this fish is dead, we've still got some nice gill color here. And our slime layer. Even though the fish is put on ice and, uh, and kept there, the slime layer is still intact. I like to bring two ice chests when I go fishing. One, to carry my favorite cold beverage, and then two is the old fish ice chest. The one you can throw the fish in, take a little ice out of your ice chest with the cold drinks, and ice down your fish. Second thing to a cleaning station is a knife. There are several different types of knives. This is a hand fillet knife. Fillet knives are made thin so that they do have some flexibility and we'll see why when we start taking the skin off this fish. Fillet knives have to be kept extremely sharp. So if you're gonna use a manual fillet knife like this, you have to have a sharpener. This knife I bought yesterday and it comes with its own set of sharpening sticks right here in the bottom. This is handy because it's not easy to forget the sharpening with this. If you don't have a sharpener on the bottom, a steel works best. I actually like a steel a little better than the ceramic sticks it seems to give me a better edge. The advantages of this fillet knife is that if you're doing this on a fishing strip or in the mountains of Colorado and there's not a, not a tree to plug your electric fillet knife into, this will, will work real well for you. We have other knives that have gained popularity recently and that's electric fillet knives. These knives um, can do a lot of fish really quickly. They work well, they do require electricity. Uh, I priced these yesterday anywhere from about $30 to $50 for an electric fillet knife. You can buy these knives. These are the old electric knives your grandmother had. You can pick them up for $2 at a garage sale. And this is actually my knife that I used to clean fish with. The third thing for a good fish cleaning station is a waste receptacle. Um, a lot of people advocate plastic trash bags. I try and reduce the amount of plastic that we use and put in landfills. If you have to use the plastic, I like to use my, recycle my plastic ice bag. This works real good to put the fish guts, the fish heads and entrails into. Or my favorite is actually just a five gallon bucket. That way I can keep it all in there and pour it out. A question arises and I'm commonly asked, well, if you're going to use a five gallon bucket, what do you do with the, the, the heads and the, the fish entrails? Uh, I like to throw them back in the pond. Some people may see this as adding more waste into a body of water. However, recycling the carcass of this fish to the little fingerling and the little bait fish in here uh, is a real natural way of taking care of this without generating more plastic for our landfills. And the fourth and last thing is we need some kind of receptacle for our fillets. Um, I just like to use Ziploc bags. Uh, they keep real well, they don't go bad. Uh, if I have a glass bowl, I break it, and a metal bowl, I lose it. So uh, these work well. You can put the fillets in here, cover them with a little water, and throw them right back in the ice chest where you had the fish until you can rinse them off in the sink at home for final freezing. As I said earlier, there are several different ways of cleaning fish. Uh, a traditional way of preparing fish, especially on the coast, is to bake or cook fish with the head on. That way you just gut the fish, removing the intestines from the abdominal cavity, remove the gills, and you bake the entire fish. However, in recent years, we've become more aware of heavy metals and toxicants that are in our water supply. Not all of these contaminants and heavy metals are from man-made pollution. Especially in the Pacific Northwest, they have high levels of mercury, lead, 
and other compounds in the waters just because it leaches out of the ground. So we have a technique in which we can prepare this fish and eliminate a lot of those contaminants. The contaminants that the fish absorbs from the water and from the other fish it eats can be concentrated in certain areas of the fish, especially the abdominal cavity and the fat. So where are these areas of fat in a fish? A fish tends to accumulate fat in the skin, in the abdomen, along the belly, and along its dorsal fin here. So as we fillet this fish, we're gonna trim those areas off. Also, many of you have probably experienced, uh, while you were eating fish, a real muddy or um, a real bad taste in a piece of fish. That's a piece of fish that came from one of these areas, a piece of muscle that the fat wasn't trimmed from. That real mud taste that we get in a lot of Oklahoma fish comes from the fact that the fat wasn't trimmed off the fish and that's what imparts a bad flavor. A lot of fish, especially catfish, that tend to be bottom feeders and tend to have a muddy taste, if you'll clean the fat off of them, you can avoid a lot of that dis distaste and, and bad flavor. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, fillet this fish. I'm gonna fillet this first fish with a, a manual fillet knife. And then we will go to the electric knives after that. Uh, the manual fillet knife has to be kept extremely sharp and it doesn't know the difference between fish bones and fingers. So we try and always cut away from ourselves when we use this fillet knife. And also we try to avoid opening the abdominal cavity. If a lot of these contaminants and fat are located in there and we can fillet this fish without ever opening the abdominal cavity, we can prevent any kind of contamination. I'm gonna show two different fillet techniques. The first one with this manual knife, we'll take it off without opening the abdominal cavity. And then the most common and the most popular in which we use an electric knife and sometimes the abdominal cavity is open. All of our equipment, our cutting surface, our knives, our hands, we've all washed and rinsed in water before we started. The first cut you want to make when you're filleting a fish, whether you're using a manual fillet knife or an electric, is always right here behind the pectoral fin, and we want to angle our cut towards the head. There's a lot of meat, it's really thick right here behind the skull plate. Down here, most of this belly meat will be discarded anyway because of the ribs that are located in it when we're through. So we want to maximize all the edible product. So we're going to make our cut until we encounter the backbone and it's going to stop us. The nice thing about filleting fish is that most of the boundaries that we need to define where we cut are limited by bone. So we can cut a lot of times until we reach the bone. Then we want to take our fillet knife and float it down the backbone, moving in a fashion like this. Once we get here, we can go ahead and Once we're behind the ribs, we can go ahead and come all the way through. And as we follow the backbone, we float our knife right on top of the backbone to the very end. Stopping about right here and not cutting this loose. We'll then open the fish up and we'll peel this fillet back. And what we're doing is just floating our knife right along the rib bones. The rib bones come off and angle to the side. Now the advantages of filleting a fish in this manner is, is that we will never open the abdominal cavity. You will never have any contamination from the intestinal tract or feces. And also, if you do live in an area which has a high level of contaminants, 
you won't get any of the abdominal fat or that type of tissues onto the fish. When you've come to right here, we'll continue this on back. Now there's three steps to filleting a fish. One is filleting, the second is skinning, and the third is deboning. When you fillet a fish in the manner we have here, you won't have to debone it because we left the bones on the fish. Right here is the belly or the abdominal cavity and it hasn't been opened. We can't see that. So this is probably the safest way to prepare fish because the abdominal cavity has never been opened. The second part of filleting is skinning and that's why fillet knives are made flexible. We can hold this fillet knife down and move it in a sawing manner all at the same time we're pushing down and we have essentially removed the skin from the fillet. Here we have a boneless, skinless fillet of meat. It should be somewhat triangular shaped. When you prepare the fish like this, there's no fat on this fish, no bones, no skin. It makes perfect table fare. There are a few species of fish in Oklahoma, the striper, the hybrid, and white bass that have what we call a lateral line that runs down right through here. All fish have it. These fish species tend to deposit some fat around that nerve trunk, and it'll be necessary to trim this out. Any red meat needs to be trimmed out because it will impart a bad flavor, and we have a, a white bass in here that I will demonstrate that to you later. I'm going to bag this fillet and then flip this fish over and fillet it with the ribs in it. I always like to start filleting a fish with the fish's back to me. Uh, the, the tissue, the meat's thicker here and it's easier to keep your knife closest to you down against that backbone. If your knife rides up, it'll ride up over here. And this is the part we're going to trim off anyway. If I do this the other way, a lot of times the knife will ride up and I'll leave a thick strip of meat down the back. Once again, we start right here behind the pectoral fin. We angle our cut forward and cut down until we feel the backbone. Without removing the knife, we turn it sideways and we're cutting the ribs as we float the knife down float it right on top of the the vertebrae of the spinal cord the backbone and we float it till we get right here and we'll flip this out you'll notice that by doing that and cutting through the ribs we actually encounter just a little bit of the abdominal contents these are eggs this is a female and there are the fish eggs. The other thing is, is that by entering some of the abdominal cavity and some of its contents, it's possible to introduce some contamination. Now, we're gonna go ahead and take these fillets back to the house in the sink and wash them off and get them preserved or cooked pretty quick so that's not a, a real threat, but if you are from an area that there are large amounts of contaminants that are concentrated in the abdomen. The other way where you don't cut the rib bones is actually a little um, and once again the skinning of the fish we put our fillet knife down under the fillet and with even strokes we skin the fish. So again, we're cutting away from us most of the time. Your finished product has almost no meat and we leave the abdominal contents in it. We're not through with this fillet though. We have filleted it, we have skinned it, and now we need to get rid of the bones. You want to put your knife and float right behind these rib bones and you can feel them with your knife and remo remove those. 
And here we have an identical looking fillet to the one that we did previously, except that we cut the rib bones off on this one, off the fish, and then removed them, and the other one we actually took the fillet off the fish. Some people will keep these ribs and they use it for stock in fish soup and that sort of thing. It's uh, not a practice I'm familiar with, so I'll leave that to uh, our kitchen experts, Barbara. I'm gonna discard the rib portion with a little bit of meat, rinse off our cutting surface. It's not necessary to do this between each fish, but it just may, makes it a little nicer and you don't have to clean the flays up quite as much when you get them home. The next fish, I'm gonna go ahead and fillet them with the electric fillet knife and you'll be able to see the speed and uh, ease at which these fillet knives work and why they're very popular now among fishermen. You can come in with quite a large catch and be able to fillet fish. I see a lot of homemade cleaning stations at the lake or at home where they have a, an old kitchen sink that has a water supply and a bench on each side and one person will be filleting fish, the other will be deboning and bagging them and you can go through a lot of fish in just a very short amount of time. Once again, the electric fillet knife does not know the difference between your finger and a fish bone, so care should be taken. One of the advantages of this fillet knife is that when it's not running, it usually doesn't cut anything. So um, it can actually be a little safer at times. We're gonna start with this fish. Once again, look how clear the eye is. There's no bloodshot, it's not opaque and fuzzy. It's nice and clear. We've got some good gill color. We're gonna start with the fish's back towards me. I'm gonna put the knife just behind the pectoral fin, angling my knife forward and cut down until I encounter the backbone. Without removing the knife, I'm gonna turn it sideways and in kind of a walking motion, I'm floating along the backbone. It's right there. And there's our fillet. We can debone this fillet and remove the skin. The other reason I like to work with the back to me is I can get the knife down below off the edge of the cutting surface and make it completely parallel with the ground. Now ideally, and we'll show you on the next fillet, we won't cut all the way to the end. I would like to cut to about right here and stop. However, I slipped using this electric knife and cut it off. You can start by doing this in much the same way. You walk your knife and we have removed it from the skin. And we removed the rib bones. There's our fillet. Skinless, boneless, no fat, no bad taste, and as free of contaminants as you can get. We'll flip the fish to the other side, make our first cut angled toward the head, cut down till we encounter the backbone, turn the fillet knife, cutting through the rib bones, kind of walking this in a saw-like mo motion to the end, and then we want to stop right here. We flip our fillet. Now we're skinning the fish. Look at that, not a bit of meat left on that skin. And then we'll debone it. Slip it right underneath the ribs. And there we have our fillets. Now that we've described in detail in slow motion how to fillet fish and why we fillet them. I've cleaned the table off. I like to rinse off the cutting surface if I have good water supply. And we're gonna go ahead and clean this fish much like we do without a lot of close pictures and instructions. And then I'm gonna demonstrate this on a couple of different 
types of fish. Uh, it's going to basically be the same pattern, but there's sometimes some special implications uh, as far as uh, like a striper or a hybrid that has the red lateral line and how to remove it. And then also we're going to demonstrate on a catfish. So just make our incision, go down to the backbone, a sawing like motion. Skinning. And then deboning. Make our first incision angled towards the head, down to the backbone. Next we'll do a crappie, basically the same exact technique, however the fish is a little more thin and a little flatter. We'll make our incision going angled up towards the head. You'll notice that the bones of these smaller fish cut a little easier. I'm going to stop right there, flip our fillet. Skin, and debone. Croppier has a little whiter meat and a little smaller fillet. We talked about earlier how the fat in fish is responsible for some of the off flavor and fishy taste in some pieces of fish. Um, and we described where the fat was and how to trim that off and keep it off of fish. There are a few species though that we mentioned earlier like hybrids and stripers and white bass that have a lateral line down the, the middle of the fillet that also is a kind of a red color. This red colored meat also imparts a very fishy or bad taste. Um, we have a, a white bass here, this is, or commonly called a sand bass. This is a state fish of Oklahoma. We're going to uh, clean it and show you the, the red line that, that should be trimmed out of it to prevent any off flavor. We're going to start our first cut angling forward towards the head like we did in, before. We'll turn our knife. Working it along the backbone, we're cutting our rib bones, and then floating along the backbone. Whoops, I slipped. Okay, you can already see some of the red color appearing in this meat on this fish. Okay, you see the red color here? This is the type of the, the muscle and the tissue that should be trimmed off of this fillet so it doesn't have a bad flavor. And you can see it comes right down the center of this fillet.
We want to trim that red meat out and everything else will be the same. I'll flip this over and try not to cut it off as we, as we do the second side. Make our first cut down to the backbone in front of the pelvic fin, behind the pectoral fin, angled towards the head. Turn our blade, float down along the backbone, cutting the ribs. Flip our fillet, skin the fish. And once again, here's this off colored meat that you don't want on the fish. We'll cut our ribs out, and then we're going to trim out that center line. If you prepare these fillets in this fashion, you can go ahead and utilize these species that have some off flavor to their meat. One question I'm commonly asked from anglers that are cleaning their own fish is, what are these yellow and black knots in the finished fillet? This fillet is from an earlier bass that we just cleaned, and I failed to see it until later. Those yellow knots are commonly called by fishermen yellow grubs. They're not a grub at all. They're actually an encysted trematode worm that insists in the muscle. And this is what I'm talking about, this yellow dot right here. It's very common, I've cleaned fish from some small farm ponds to find these all distributed through the muscle of the fillet. You'll cut the fillet open and there'll be a nice round yellow dot right in the middle of that meat. Now, the question is, is what is this and is this a problem? Do I need to throw it away? Will it be a, a health concern and is it still consumable? This is an insisted metasicarian trematode worm and if this fish is cleaned like we have and cooked properly it poses absolutely no human health hazard at all. It's most common in our bass and sunfish species uh, and it can be removed quite easily. I'm going to go ahead and remove this one my knife and if you or your family are somewhat squeamish about eating this it can be easily dissected loose or trimmed out so uh, if you see it distributed through the muscle you can go ahead and trim those out so that there's uh, no problem aesthetically for you eating the fish we've demonstrated the uh, ways to fillet fish in a way that we can get a nice edible product with minimal contaminants. However, uh, and we've shown in some species how if we remove the red meat and the red line, it will remove the fishy taste and off, off taste in our fish. One thing I do want to address and not avoid here uh, is to leave anybody out. So I want to talk about catfish. Catfish from Oklahoma South are, are a huge sport fish uh, and the reason why we want to talk about this different is a lot of anglers like to skin catfish they'll actually pull the skin off first and then clean the fish I have uh, helped people skin catfish this is a flathead catfish and this catfish can get in excess of 70 pounds and so when we clean a fish that gets that large sometimes there's special considerations Many people, if they get catfish that are over 20, 30 pounds, they like to hang them up and skin the fish and then go ahead and clean them. I'm going to attempt to fillet this fish by hand on one side and then fillet it with a fillet knife, an electric fillet knife on the other side and show that we can go ahead and remove catfish skin the same way you can with a really good knife and it will alleviate the, the, the hand skinning problem. We'll go ahead and make an incision, very much the same way we did, angling towards the head. Now, catfish put a lot of fat and they concentrate it in their belly, belly meat right along here. So, and that's also where our ribs are, so we're typically going to try and avoid that. We're going to 
float our fillet knife along the backbone or the spinal cord. We're going to float our knife along these rib bones, tease that off. We're not even going to enter the abdominal cavity. Once we get past the ribs, we can go ahead and uh, fillet the fish normally. Walk in our fillet knife along the backbone to the end and hopefully we'll leave it attached. We'll flip our fillet. And skin this. Now, even though this is catfish skin, we can still use our fillet knife. This type of method. To remove the fillet and leave the skin. Boneless, skinless fillet. On the next side, I'm going to use the electric knife, electric fillet knife. Here we have our catfish fillet. This area right here, this is some of this belly meat and the pelvic fin, which tends to have fat around it. We want to remove that and then trim off our ribs. And we end up with a catfish fillet. Now that we've finished cleaning our fish, we uh, get all the fillets in a bag and get these on ice until we can get them home for a final rinse. We want to rinse these off again and rebag them. We've discussed uh, several different methods of cleaning fish, several different tools for cleaning fish, and there are a multitude of ways of doing this. Filleting fish, removing the bones, removing the fat, not entering the ab abdominal cavity are just uh, tools that we can use to prevent contamination and spoilage of this product from the lake to your plate. Once you get the fillets in the house or whatever form your fish is coming in the house, you have some decisions to make. First of all, you want to make sure that it stays cold. It'll stay cold in your refrigerator for somewhere between one to two days, and then you need to make other steps. If you want it to stay cold even better in the refrigerator, you can make sure that you wrap it well in a plastic Ziploc type of bag, freezer versions to make sure that it's heavy duty, and then put it in a bowl of ice water and put it in the very back of the refrigerator. Still is only going to give you that one to two days, but you'll have a little bit better quality by the time that comes to pass. The next thing after, you either need to cook it, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, or you need to put it in the freezer. Once it's in the freezer, you're going to have somewhere between two to three months of storage, and it's going to be dependent on what kind of freezer you have, 
have, how cold your, refrigerator, your freezer is. If you have a self-defrosting freezer, you're going to get the shorter end because every time it self-defrosts, it's going to defrost the food a little bit and shorten your freezer time. So let's see how we're going to get it to the freezer. That's where we're going to start today. Uh, I have two different sizes of fillets, and this is real common when you go fishing. You know, all your fish are not going to come out to be the same size. And what I'm going to do is try and cut them down to portion size so that when you come to use them, you can use all, you can pull out the number of servings that you're going to need and that's going to help you from cooking too much and wasting it from having leftovers it's also going to help you stop from eating too much and even though the fish in Oklahoma are lean you still don't want to eat too many this one is going to be a uh, fairly good size for a portion if we put it on the scale let me start the scale up and let it zero out uh, you're going to see that it's probably going to be somewhere between two to three ounces that's a little bit small for a serving we want to aim for two to three servings but uh, it's always better to go with a little bit lighter on some of the protein foods in this case and fill up your plate with some vegetable items. Uh, this one we're going to cut in half and that's going to give us something that's very similar in size to uh, what the other one was when it actually goes into the freezer. So just eyeball it since we're just going to cut it in half. If it was larger you might want to do a little bit differently. But notice this end is a little bit thicker than, than this end so we're going to by weight we're going to give this one a little bit longer in appearance just use a really nice sharp knife cut through that and there you should have something that will give you really close to uh, two servings on this now the next step as you get it ready for the freezer uh, is you want to dip it and this is going to make that fish last longer in the freezer give better quality hold up better when you thaw it and give less loss when you cook it it doesn't take very long what I have here is about a quart of water and a fourth of a cup of just table salt. For this purpose, it doesn't have to be canning salt or kosher salt or whatever salt you've got there will work just fine. Stir it around. You may not quite get it all dissolved, but it'll come fairly close. And then we're gonna pour it into a container. You may not need anything near this size. Uh, and you may need to, you can also cut this down. If you have as few fish as I do, you could make uh, two tablespoons and two cups of, of water uh, would work equally well. Now we're going to dip this in here for 20 seconds. Now let me set my timer and you could do several of them at the same time and while that's go getting ready I'm going to get ready for the next stage there are a couple of ways that you can put the fish into the freezer and I'm going to give you the one that gives the best results now there are alternative methods, and I should be about done with my 20 seconds, so let's turn that off. Uh, and we're going to fish our fish back out of here and just let it drain off, just let it dip, drip dry. And I'm going to put it on a baking pan with sides simply to keep it from sliding off in the, in the freezer. And I have freezer paper here. Now I'm not going to use freezer paper later to wrap the fish. What I'm using it for here is to simply lay it out. At this point I want to put this in the freezer and freeze it solid. Now doing the fish this, this method, the one that I'm going to choose, is called can, it's like candling or uh, putting wax on a candle. We're going to dip it in ice water multiple times until we get uh, a layer of a glaze built up on this fish. An alternative method that you could use would be to put the fish into a bag like this, a heavy duty freezer freezer bag uh, and then fill it up with just a small amount of water and then put that directly in the freezer. The faster you freeze your fish, the better quality you're going to have in the long run. You're going to maintain nutrients longer, you're going to maintain the firmness of the flesh longer, so the faster it freezes the better. So make sure you have your freezer turned down to about zero. Try not to do this on a day where you have, you know, eight pounds of fish and try and put it all in at the same time. Uh, so spread your fishing experiences out a little, I guess. Uh, try to uh, catch fewer one day and, and even it out. Uh, like I'm sure that's possible. Uh, anyway, so this is going to go directly in the freezer. I've got a little bit more water on here. I want to get that off. And we're going to freeze this solid. The problem with putting the water into the bag and then freezing that is first of all, it's going to take a little bit longer to freeze. And second of all, you're not going to be able to take out one fish fillet or one serving at a time. The way I'm going to do it, you're going to be able to take out one serving at a time. Now an alternative method uh, to what I'm going to do, another one, would be to use the vacuum seal bags and that right after you get the dipping done, you can go ahead and, and seal them in, in individually in uh, vacuum seal bags. That will also give you fairly long storage too, but if you don't have those, then this method works really well. Again, you want this going in a freezer that's at zero degrees 
and I've got one that's been in there a while. This one I didn't cut down to size, uh, and I want to do uh, another step to uh, this one as well. Okay, this one is frozen solid, and now you can see the advantage of freezing it on the freezer paper. Because it has this shiny side, uh, it doesn't stick, so we'll be able to lift it right out. And we'll start the glaze at this point. I have a pan that's got ice water in it. It's just plain ice water, no salt, no anything else, just water with ice in it. And the pan needs to be big enough to hold the fish. What we're going to do is, again, frozen solid. We're going to stick it in the ice water, and we're just going to roll it over and let it drip off. And that's going to gradually add the glaze. Now you're going to put this one, again, directly back into the freezer, and we're going to do this five, six times. Because it's a thin filet, it's not going to take very long to freeze. So it doesn't add a lot of work. It doesn't add a lot of time to what you're doing. You can keep using the same ice water again and again. Uh, depending on the temperature of your freezer, this may freeze ready for the next step to repeat this step within about 30 minutes. Now I have a couple in the freezer that I've been working on. Now these have about five layers of the glaze on them already, and you can see when you look at them that they're shiny. They're also not going to stick together, so that when I pick them up and put them together, they're solid little beasts. Uh, I can put them in the freezer, they're frozen planks, and you can definitely see the difference in those between this one that's not frozen as far as being able to see the glaze on it quite well. Now the next thing that you want to do is to make sure you package them in amounts that you're probably going to use at one meal. Because they're already frozen solid, it's not essential, but you don't want to use a great big bag. The reason that you don't want to use this size of a freezer bag is because you're not going to be able to get very much of the air out there. And that air is the enemy. That air allows for dehydration. Even though we've got the glaze on it, you might have to get a little bit of frosty around it, uh, some ice crystals, and then eventually you're going to get some freezer burns. So you want to choose a bag that will hold the amount that you've prepared th and the amount that you're probably going to eat at one time so that you, you don't open it too many times. This is a pint size bag. Uh, if you're going to uh, s put two of the fillets in here, or maybe there's only two of you in the house, or that would work very well. Uh, if there's uh, four fillets going to be prepared at one meal, then you could choose something a little bit larger like, like this one. The thing that you want to do as you put these in, again, you could wrap them uh, individually a bit more, but because you've already frozen them individually, they're not going to stick together, so it's really not necessary. You're going to get, make sure that you get all the air out of it that you can, and then close it tightly. Get it in the freezer after you do one more thing. Um, most of these bags now have an area that you can take a Sharpie or some other kind of uh, tool and write what it is. You need to write the day that you put this in, what kind of fish it is so that you know when you pull it out or someone else pulls it out, and then you need to put uh, on it about the amount. So this is going to be about a pound of fillets. Uh, you want to make sure that you had all that information on there before it goes into the freezer. Put it on now because chances are you're not going to remember to come back and do this later. These are going to be able to keep in the freezer for anywhere from two to three months, as I mentioned earlier. The thing that you have to remember at that point is to thaw them safely. Um, if you want the best results, the, the best quality fish, the least uh, loss when you uh, serve them, the, the least amount of runoff during the thawing process itself, put about a pound, it'll thaw overnight in the refrigerator. So I could put these in the refrigerator the night before when I come home from work the next day. These are going to be ready for me uh, without any work. So there's only the one thing that I have to remember is to get them out and freeze in the first place. If, however, I forget that one little thing, I have a couple of more options. One is to keep them in the bag. It's sealed tight. Uh, fill a bowl, again, with ice water and put them, submerge them in the water. If, you, if they tend to float because there's a little bit of air in there, then set something on them that will hold them down, not something really heavy, but maybe like a plate uh, that would hold them down under the water, uh, and they'll thaw fairly quickly. But the, you must remember at that point that once they're thawed under that technique, you have to go ahead and cook them right away. The third method that you could use if, uh, to thaw would be in the microwave. It's the least successful. It gives the lowest quality results. Because it cooks unevenly, you may actually get some cooking. So do it on defrost. Uh, make sure you know the amount of, of weight for most of them when they thaw. Uh, do it on the defrost setting. And then take them out while there's still a little bit of ice in them because they're going to continue to thaw fairly quickly. So I'm going to get these in the freezer. And uh, within the next couple of months, I'm going to have fish dinner. 
when cooking, whether you're cooking with fish that you've just caught or whether you're pulling fish out of the freezer that you caught earlier or even if you've cheated and gone to the supermarket and got some fish there if the, the fishing wasn't really good that day, uh, the basic cooking method stays the same. There's something called a 10 minute rule for cooking fish that works really, really well that will keep you from having to learn a lot of different methods. It works for everything except deep frying, which hopefully you're not going to use a lot of anyway, uh, and microwaving. The 10 minute rule means that you look at the thickest part of the fish. And this one's going to be about a half an inch, but for every inch you set the oven at 450 degrees, and if it's 10, in, uh, it's 10 minutes for every inch. So at a half an inch thick, we're going to cook it for five minutes at 450 degrees. And that works extremely well whether you're grilling it or whether you're going to bake it or whether you're going to pan fry it. Uh, so for all those methods, that 10 minute rule will work very well. Now today I'm going to prepare a recipe for baked fillets that I I'm going to reduce the temperature a little bit. Uh, most of the fish in Oklahoma is, is fairly lean, and so baking works fairly well. It works a little bit better than frying, simply because with frying, it can cook a little bit faster on the edges than with some other methods, particularly deep fat frying. And that's where you start to get fish that's falling apart, that's overcooked. So I'm going to take these fillets, and I've got a foil line pan here. Uh, you can either use the kind of foil that, isn't, that has its built-in nonstick, or you can spray it with nonstick spray. Uh, just lay them on here and I'm going to put the thicker ones towards the edges and I'm going to put the thicker sides toward the edges and then I'm going to match the thinner sides together as well. If they won't fit then you can overlap these thin sides a little bit and that will work too to help uh, keep them cooking at a fairly even pace. Now Again, I'm going to use a recipe that's already designed for a little bit lower oven temperature, but because these fillets are still fairly thin, everything's still going to cook in about 10 to 12 minutes, even though I've lowered the oven temperature to, uh, to 425. So you, you pretty much have to have the rest of the meal ready to go or just about ready to go. If you're going to cook some vegetables, you want to put those uh, to heat in boiling water about the same time you put the fish in. There's not going to be a long standing time after the fish come out of the oven like there would be with a roast or a steak to let the juices uh, move back around and, and evenly, uh, even out the cooking. Uh, this is going to be pretty much ready to go when it comes out. So I've got two tablespoons of a reduced fat ranch dressing. You could also use uh, mayonnaise with this, uh, light mayonnaise, regular mayonnaise. I'm using a ranch dressing because it adds a little bit more flavor. And then to that I'm going to stir in one tablespoon of a Dijon mustard and just stir those together. If you have a flavored mayonnaise, uh, one that maybe already has the Dijon mixed in, you could use that, but I hate to buy something special just for one recipe, so unless that's something that I use all the time, I'm not going to invest in it for this. Now you could spread this out on the fish with uh, just a uh, spoon. I'm going to go uh, make it a little bit easier. I'm going to use this brush, and we may not use all of this. Uh, I don't want to use more than we actually would uh, need to coat this. So we're just going to spread this on. This is going to add a lot of flavor and also add a little bit of moistness. One of the things people worry about with fish, oh, it's so easy to overcook and I'm afraid of it and so I'm not going to do it. If you add a coating like this to it uh, or a sauce to it, uh, it helps retain the moisture. Fattier fish work also on that technique. It's harder to overcook some of those, but again, fatty fish are not real common in Oklahoma uh, and so we don't have that luxury if we're going to go out and catch it ourselves. We have to take the, the trip to the, one of the coasts and go for salmon or something like that. Again, we get that just spread out. You don't have to put it on both sides, just the one side will work. It's also going to act as a, sort of a, an adherent to hold the next couple of ingredients together. Now this recipe calls for four tablespoons of dried breadcrumbs. You could make your own dry breadcrumbs simply by drying out the bread for a few days. You can go to the market and buy it. Don't buy the seasoned variety. And I'm listing this on the recipe as four tablespoons rather than a fourth of a cup, which is the way I usually like to do things, because I want you to know how much to put on each fillet. You have four fillets, you're going to put about a fourth of the, the dry breadcrumbs on each of those fillets. So uh, simply spread those on. They're going to be stuck to it a little bit by the uh, sauce we just put on there or the dressing. And then there's a final layer that we're going to put on top of this once I get all of these spread out. I want to make sure that you get it fairly evenly coated and that you get the entire fish covered up. It doesn't matter if it goes over because you're not going to serve it on the plate. So if you get some that's on the, on the foil, it's not going to be hard to clean up. You're going to throw the foil away. 
The last thing, again, four tablespoons of chopped pecans. And because we're in Oklahoma, I am using chopped pecans, but if you have in your freezer another kind of nut, walnuts uh, would work, uh, as would almonds if you have some of those. The trick on this is just to make sure that you get them fairly finely cut, uh, chopped up. You don't want to have somebody have a great big piece in their mouth at one time. And you want to make sure that you divide them, again, about one tablespoon for each of the fillets. These are then going to go in the oven, again, 425. You've preheated the oven to make sure that, the, that it's ready and hot. So preheat it when you start to, to do everything else. Most ovens will take around 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the size of the oven. Slide them in, 10 to 12 minutes, you're going to come back and check them. All right, we've got the first 10 minutes. You always want to check things at the short period of time. These are supposed to cook anywhere from 10 to 12. Now, as far as checking to see when they're done, often people use a fork to do this, but a knife works equally well. Just stick it in there and, and pull away, and you can see that that's now opaque. It's starting to flake. Use a sharp knife, however, and you'll do a little bit less damage than if you actually test them with a fork. So these are ready to, to go on over to uh, the table. One of the things that you want to make sure to take care of is that uh, you are careful not to burn any nuts that you use. So make sure that you do check them. Uh, mostly this is going to be enough time to uh, just toast the nuts up, but if you see a couple that have scorched a little bit more than you want, that just take those off. There you see a plate that would be called the New Oklahoma plate where we have basically it divided into quadrants. One of the quadrants is going to be the protein por portion. Two of the quadrants are going to be produce of some kind. And then the last quadrant is going to be a whole grain. I've served this with brown rice. I hope you go to the DVD and look at this recipe as well as the others. Remember that 10 minute rule. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility in, in what you can do once you understand how that 10 minute rule works.